This time I'm going to look at a Sony Super Beta. This is an SLHF750. This is the one that has Beta 1S, Beta 2, and Beta 3 and four heads. And the mechanism's in a drawer that slides out to the front. How cool is that? This one's a Sony SLHF750. This is one that Sony came out with a unique design with the mechanism in a drawer. I don't know why, but they did. It's essentially a top loader machine that um, had an entire mechanism that slid out just to add complexity to it. Don't know what's wrong with this one, so we're going to get a tape, load the tape up, and uh, give it a try and see what this one's doing and whether this one can be fixed. This one came in from Toronto, or Ontario, and it was hand delivered to me by the, the owner who brought it all the way out to me, in a taxi I might add. We'll see whether this tape plays. Looks like uh, the heads might be clogged are very close to being clogged. Let's turn on the Super Beta, or sorry, Super Beta. Turn on the Super Beta switch. Yeah, okay, this is his problem. And now it won't eject either. Got a couple of problems with this machine because it won't eject. So I guess I have to pull the top off this one and see why it uh, has jammed the tape. I wonder if it's eaten it. So let's just see why this won't eject. And now, of course, now it will. Okay, well, it didn't the first time. What is this? You can see right there that that's uh, one great big mess of wires. It's just an accident waiting to happen. <clears throat> when this design came out, I thought it was one of the dumbest designs that Sony ever had. And I wasn't alone in that that feeling. <clears throat> it looks like uh, it almost looks like bad heads if we look at the picture. I can see a few things happening here. Look at how the tape is being damaged. The tape is rolled over here. On that guide. It's probably not doing it any good. Try cleaning the heads on this one first. Let's see whether uh, that improves it. I don't. I don't think it's dirty. Well, it looks like a dirty head actually. Right now, it's what it looks like. It looks like it's a bad head that's clogged up right now on the screen. These units are always fun to clean the heads on because you've got this big plate in the way that uh, gets right where you really need to get to to clean it. That's much better. Right on the left hand side is Hans Jaeger. Over on the right is 
Victor Vizcarro. I'm working in the beach area. The now this is a super beta tape. If I turn the super beta off, you'll see what it looks like over modulation, which it is. Super beta off, you can see super beta on. I also notice that the machine is set in the MPX filter is turned on with the PCM mode selected, which is something you don't want to do. PCM mode disables the dropout compensator. So with the dropout compensator off, you'll see dropouts like you just saw on the screen there. You see the dropouts. Now I turn the dropout compensator on and it should it should cancel them out. Again, this tape is in pretty pretty rough shape. It's very, very old. Dropout compensator on these is switched by there's a switch on the front. You'll see there's a switch here. MPX filter off and on. That's to turn on the multiplex filter for the uh, FM circuits for when you're recording with a simulcast and then PCM and what PCM was for that was for if you were using the uh, PCM adapter here's a good example I got there's some there's some really bad dropouts on the tape here I'm going to rewind it and show you I'll show it to you with the PCM it, I'll show it to you with the dropout compensator off so in PCM mode on here's the switch PCM and then your MPX filter PCM disables the dropout compensation and the reason it does is if you are using this machine with a PCM F1 adapter or whatever the other model one they had but PCM was to record digital audio onto the video portion. What it did was it formatted a digital audio or, or formatted an audio signal in digital 16-bit just like a CD but it formatted as a video frame that was recorded by a VCR. It would work on any VCR, VHS or Beta, but the thing is, in order for the PCM adapter to work, the video machine had to have the built-in dropout compensator turned off. The reason for that is how the comp how the dropout compensator operates. I'll explain this while I show it. So you'll see if I replay this tape, there's a section here where there's some creases in the tape. You see all the white lines that go through there. Well, that's loss of video. That's loss of signal. If I turn on the dropout compensator, you'll notice that it removes them. If I turn it off, there it's off. Now it's on. Now it's on, off, and now it's back on. Sometimes the dropout compensator will operate when you're playing back an old tape and cause some instability like that. And there's not a lot you can do if the DOC or dropout compensator kicks in because it's based on the level of the signal coming off the tape. This the head's just kind of contaminated again. This tape is obviously losing its oxide coating and contaminating the heads. But normally you run the dropout compensator on. It's on now. You can see there's some picture instability. And the reason that there is is because the dropout compensator is firing in error. If we turn the dropout compensator off, we'll get a clearer picture with no dropout compensation, then we'll see the dropouts showing up as white streaks of snow that occur in the picture. Turn it back on, we get a little bit of instability on it, especially on a digital monitor. Now on an analog TV, on a CRT TV, we probably won't even see that. I can hook this up to an analog set and I can confirm that it doesn't do it because of just the way the analog TVs operate. You guys probably wonder why I have that set up there. Yeah, I use it for um, looking at my cameras, right? My security cameras I show on there from time to time. It's got burn in, but the real reason that that set is up there is as an analog monitor for when I'm working on something and I need a CRT. So I just have that TV 
kind of stuck up there in the corner because it's got the inputs on the front. So if I go back to this tape, okay, so here it is playing with the dropout compensator off and you can see all the dropouts, all the beautiful dropouts showing up on the tape there and I'll switch it on. Of course the heads are going to clog. Okay, so the dropout compensator is off. You'll see the dropouts and I'll turn it on. But we're not getting the pitcher disturbance that we were getting when I was on the plasma set. And that's just because of the, the timing issues between the analog sets and the digital, or the analog signal and the digital. That picture is actually looking pretty good. It's too bad that that tube has gotten the burn in. Because that TV looks pretty, pretty good. Other than the, the permanent burn in from my use as a monitor. But as you can see, this beta machine is, is playing perfect on it. Got sound. I'll turn off the dropout compensator by putting it back in PCM, and you'll start to see the dropouts will start to, as a dropout occurs, you'll see it. You see, there's one right at the bottom of the screen there. You can see the dropouts. White specks that appear in the screen. The picture. Dropout compensator back on. Oh, yeah, it actually improves the picture too. There it's on. So the dropout should be masked. There's some dropouts there that were masked. You saw them. If I turn it off, there's a bunch of dropouts and back on. I'll try to illustrate how a dropout compensator works on these analog machines. I'm trying to oversimplify this just so that you guys get an idea of how the system works. So you have two video paths. You have your, your RF output from the head and it goes to your demodulator which gives you your luminance or your black and white information, your video. No chroma. The chroma goes to the chroma circuits over here which is completely separate because the dropout compensation has in no way affects the chroma. It's only on the luminance signal. So there's two identical paths that go through an op amp. Both signals are operate are, are amplified exactly the same way. One signal is passed through to a switch which continues out and then it, this luminance output goes to your to your chroma circuit to to YC. And that's also where your chroma, your chroma would come in there as well, right? From the chroma circuits, that would go to your YC circuits. The second path that the video takes is through a one horizontal line analog delay. This is a, a glass delay line. Think of it like a, a transducer on each end and a piece of glass. And it takes time for the signal to travel through the glass. Works very much like the old spring a reverb devices that were in old guitar amplifiers and electric organs and so forth that would send the audio signal through a transducer where it would go through a long spring and get to the other end. Of course, the spring would cause it to resonate and you'd get the nice reverb sound. But if it was just a straight piece of wire without a bunch of coils in it, then what would arrive at the other end was a, a delayed a delayed signal because it had to travel through this wire. In the case of the video signal, it's traveling through a piece of glass. And I can probably show you a delay line on here because you can see them. They're typically big orange boxes or black boxes. It'll say delay line on it. But it's a one horizontal delay. And they're also used in the chroma circuits because the chroma circuit itself is typically delayed by a couple of lines during processing. So you don't want your chroma to be too far delayed. And this is why when you make copies of tapes, you always get a bit of a delay because the chroma is always a line behind the video. And if you make a second or third or fourth generation, uh, a prime example was, uh, I think I saw a demo on it once, where they had a woman with, with bright red lipstick on and they made like a fourth generation tape and her lips, her, her, the color from her lipstick was down on her chin by about the fourth generation. But anyway, um, 
the both the circuits, both the video from the demodulator goes through both of these amplifiers, and then one goes through a one horizontal delay line, and then it's amplified again to bring the levels back so they're the same. And the RF is also going into a level detector, and that level detector is detecting the RF level. And what happens is during a dropout, the RF will drop down. And if it drops below the cutoff point for the level detector, the level detector throws a switch to switch over to the delayed video, which is one horizontal line behind the original, so that you can cut into the video before it was missing. It's a little more complex than this because this circuit is actually fed back. So when it when it switches onto the delay line, this is actually fed back. So it switches in on this side as well. So the video forms a, a loop. So that if the if the if the dropout lasts more than one line, it will stay on this. So when the when the dropout compensator kicks in, the video is actually fed back into here again. So that the one line of video will keep going over and over and over and repeating to the point where there's no more dropout and then the level detector detects that there's RF again and it will turn the switch off and pass the, the playback video through. When you turn on the PCM switch you're cutting off the power so this is in the off position when you turn it on you're cutting off the power so that this is out of the circuit so then your video is always just passing through and going through because when you are using the machine as a digital audio recorder you can't have this repeated line of information that will cause errors and make your digital signal unrecoverable when you're recording digital there's error correcting data that's included in the digital payload that will compensate for any errors or any loss of signal but with video of course you don't want to see those white streaks every time there's a dropout you use the dropout compensator this in this case the dropout compensator was turned off because it was in PCM mode and that of course cause white specks to appear on the screen however as I showed when I had this playing on the plasma when the dropout compensator is turned on it can cause disruptions on digital TVs just because of the way that they process the signal so sometimes turning off the dropout compensator will give you an improved picture on a flat panel screen but on a CRT set the opposite is true it looks better when you've got your dropouts compensated here are the delay lines I'm talking about there's two of them here one of them's there and the other one is over here I forget which one of these one is the dropout compensator on this I think it was this one one of them is a one line delay and the other is a three line delay the three line delay is used in the chroma processing if I'm not mistaken, it's been so long since I've actually dug into the circuitry, I'd have to stare at the schematic. But anyway, this is the, the dropout compensator. So this is my tape that I recorded back in 1985 when I was doing my Super Beta training. So the dropout compensator is off there. You can see them. I'll turn it back on. See the difference? Picture looks a little bit better without the dropout compensator on, but because it certainly looks a little sharper. Dropout compensator off, dropout compensator on, but it'll kill the dropouts. So you're not seeing the dropouts there. And there are dropouts happening. I'll turn it back off. You'll see there's a dropout right away, right? With dropout compensator on, you see them all the time. So if I rewind that tape a bit, just so you can see where that one was, I'll turn it back on. There it was there. Turn the dropout compensator back on. You see? When you took off its glass, you didn't see it. Rewind the tape back a bit. Turn it off. And he takes his glasses off, there's the dropout. Turn the dropout compensator on. Takes his glasses off, you don't see it. I, I think that pretty much explains how the dropout compensator works. And why, why it was important to have it. 
and why it was important to disable it if you were going to be dealing with PCM. I'd also point out that many VHS machines did not have a dropout compensator that worked anywhere near as well as the Betamax machines. On these beta machines, dropouts, you didn't even really notice them. VHS, you always saw dropouts. Beta machines, you very rarely saw them unless they were really extremely bad creases and so forth in the tape, then you'd see it. Okay, these machines are hard to clean the heads on because getting at the back here to access the head, you'll see that they're you really don't have good access at the back to the head. There's not a lot of room. This is where the head is exposed back here through this large slot here. Uh, cleaning sticks might be able to get in there around over here but don't clean it where the the gap is because it's too easy to damage the head. If you're going to clean it with paper you can do it right down here. You can also do it at the front if we remove this um, bracket. It's a little easier to get to. You can pop the bracket out right here. Now we can access the rest of the drum for cleaning. We'll try our Beta 2 tape. Oops. The problem with these old tapes is that they're all getting to the point where they're contaminating the head as fast as you can clean it a lot of times. So here's another tape. This one's Beta 2. The other one I was playing was Beta 3. That's the dropout compensator off, as you can see. You're seeing the dropout show up. The dropout compensator on. The heads on this machine were quite dirty. I've actually cleaned them twice. As this being a forehead machine. And this is one of the few machines that had Beta 1S. So this could record in Beta 1S as well as Beta 2 and Beta 3. It did not have the super high band that the SLHF 1000 had. So this is a Beta 2 tape. Personally, I think it's one of the dumber designs that Sony had. As soon as I saw this one, I just laughed. I shook my head because you wonder how many times this is going to open and close before these wires start to go intermittent and break, right? You got a lot of wires there that are bending every time you open it and close it. If you take a wire and bend it back and forth enough, what do you think is going to happen to it? Eventually, it's going to break and you're going to end up with intermittent connections. Just another, another thing to go wrong with this machine. Plus, having to add that extra shield there so that you don't see the heads and so forth. That's so that uh, when you eject the tape, it doesn't do anything other than the fact that when you eject the tape, you will see the head drum. And that's to keep people's fingers out of there because, you know, people would be curious to stick their finger in there. Get their finger caught in there. Take their finger off. Do some damage. Yeah. I mean, the idea of it was kind of neat, but really, it was uh, an added problem that would just create more headaches down the road when these machines started to break down. Although this machine is how many years old now? What, close to 40 years old? And it's still working. That's got a great picture. Had a bad picture when it came in. Pretty sure this machine is suffering from the upper drum being excessively polished just from the look of it there. Um, let's just take a look at the upper drum. I'll have to pull it to uh, to show it to you, but let's just take a look. We'll pull the upper drum off this one and see how badly uh, polished this one is. This is an easy one to take off. We'll just put a couple of reference marks on there. I bet it's I bet it's polished pretty good. And that causes the tension to change as the tape goes around the head drum and can cause it makes it look like the heads are worn in a lot of cases.
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See that? That is really quite uh, bad. As all these machines are getting. You see how shiny that is, right? So we're going to we're going to dull this down a bit. I'm going to get some Comet cleanser and mix up a little bit of a paste with some water and a piece of paper towel. We're going to we'll shine this, take the shine off, and see how the uh, how the picture looks once I do that. So how we do this is we take our paste that we make up using some Comet kitchen cleanser and some water, and we're going to use this paste to remove the shine that's on this upper drum. I may need a little more water on here but basically we just go around here and you can see the aluminum oxide that's coming off of it. We just work this around And remove that shine so that it'll be a uniform color. Now there was a time when we would change the actual the actual um, upper drum when the upper drums were readily available that was obviously the preferred way to do it because by doing this we're actually removing a very minute layer of the surface which will change the dimensions if you do it enough times. You can usually do this once or twice without uh, too many problems but if you start doing this on a regular basis eventually you're going to change the dimensions slightly and uh, that's going to create even more problems tracking wise but the, the thing is you can't get the drum parts anymore right there they, they aren't made uh, they haven't been made for many, many years, so the only option we have to try to save these machines is to do this. So I'm just going to work on this for a bit, and then I'll wash it off with some water, and I'll show you what the results are. But you remember what it looked like when we started? It's going to look like a brand new drum when I'm done. So if you remember how this looked before, it looks almost like new now. That's what we want. We want to get rid of that shine because that causes the tape tension to change and when the tape tension is uh, not equal as the tape passes over the drum it can cause what looks like bad heads Now the reason I put the two scratches on here is so that I can get the alignment exactly the way it was when I took it off. You can see that I put two marks on there. That way I can get the position exactly the same when I tighten it up. Okay, that's looking pretty good now. Let's see if our little streaks that almost look like a bad head are gone. Yeah, 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 I know the burning on that tube is pretty, pretty bad. I may put this set back into service as a camera monitor again at some point and put a different CRT up in that on that bracket just for this uh, type of work. I did have a little 8 inch Sony sitting on top of my bench here but I can put that away again. I'm just using this one because it's got AV inputs on the front so I can plug it in when I need it. That's looking pretty good. Turn off the super beta, we'll see it. All right, you see the super see the lines there. So this is an old, very old tape too.
this machine also had slow motion and still single frame advance forward and reverse slow mo that's slow reverse slow forward one tenth there's a slow tracking control slow is not absolutely perfect on these machines regular speed two times speed scan which you could lock the scan on here's my master tape <laughs> of course the heads clogged don't of course because the tape is so bad this is from 1987 I guess was when I recorded this sign says 1987 so that would be when I was there with this one this was uh, original footage that was shot on a Sony GCS1 the, the industrial beta movie back in the day tape is showing its age this video incidentally is up on my YouTube channel this is the raw footage so they'll just be the sound that I recorded at the street and you keep the heads from clogging up I went down there twice with camera actually I went down more than twice but I went down there twice and shot the signs this was uh, shot with say a beta movie uh, GCS1 the time before when I shot the strip I was uh, carrying around a tube camera with um, a VO I think it was a VO4800 I had this machine appears to be working properly now I'm not seeing any indication of any problems certainly a lot better than when I started on it I think the majority of the problem on this was that head drum was polished so because it gets almost mirror like uh, finish on it it starts to stick in fact on that uh, Sony seminar we actually talked about that if I could find it I can play it for you if I can find where he talked about the polishing of the upper drum so it was a it was a problem that was known way back and that's where I learned about the using the Comet cleanser so this is how the tape is supposed to look take a look at the tape hubs on this old tape this is a modern tape by the way this is I've got I've still got a couple of these factory seal this is the last generation of tape that Sony made before they stopped making beta tape this was the what the box looked like at the end take a look at these ones that they've aged so much that the plastic hubs have actually turned yellow I bet you they'll break if I put any type of any type of stress on them I bet you the plastic will start to crack gives you an idea how old this tape it still plays but how much longer it's gonna play is anyone's guess there's the beta 3 tape playing from the training seminar from 1985 this is on a scotch tape that's probably why it's held up so well anyway I think this one's done it's playing beta 2 and beta 3 I haven't tried beta 1 because I don't have any beta 1 S tapes I only have beta 1 S H B and this will not play the super high band my other tape that uh, had the erasure every time the, the the tape made a rotation I'm redoing that one so I'll have another beta 2 tape for playback so I just made a fresh recording on my SL HF 1000 at uh, beta 2 we're gonna let this one play let this tape play for a couple of hours well it's a three hour tape so I'm gonna run, I've already run it through once so this is actually the second pass I'll show you the picture I can't show this for more than a few seconds because it'll pull a copyright because it's just stuff I pulled down off of YouTube but I'll show it for a few seconds complete with the odd crease in the tape we'll fast forward a bit here well there it is this one's playing back perfect now I'm just going to let it play for a while before buttoning it back up, but I think uh, it's pretty safe to say that this one's working properly now. It's tracking up properly. Heads are clean. 
the upper drum has now had that sheen taken off of it and everything is looking good. So thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now. Or should I say subscribe now.